Uh, and I didn't, however, expect the wonderful support that I've in fact received. Uh, the organization and advertising of the series has been uh, superb. And special thanks, therefore, to Leon Hall, to Faye Duard, to Fiona Simpson, Amelia Gilloway, and Annie Little. And their enthusiasm has really warmed my heart. And I'm very pleased, as I said, to see old faces amongst the audience. And uh, I can assure those who have attended the past series uh, that things won't change much now that they're in the law school. Uh, Caroline mentioned the topics that we've covered in the past. Uh, just uh, some titles uh, for you, The Invasion of Iraq, Politics, The Glory and the Misery, Multiculturalism, and The War on Terror, Rethinking Our Place in Nature, uh, Who's Afraid of International Law, Gaza, Morality, Law and Politics. And it's evident that this year's uh, title, Secrecy, Power and Democracy, represents no uh, serious shift in kind of a topic that will be discussed. And I hope it goes without saying that collectors will continue to set high standards. I started the series uh, 11 years ago because I believe that it's on the whole a good thing if academics speak without any condescension to a lay audience uh, that is reasonably well educated, serious and prepared to think hard, uh, but to speak without condescension and also without in any way compromising uh, the, the, the integrity of the discipline. And I'm sure that the reason the lectures have been so successful and earned a degree of affection and loyalty amongst Melbournians is because the people I've chosen to give them rose to that challenge, and that's not going to change either. Well, the topic of this year's series emerged from discussion with Guy Rundle in a restaurant in Soho uh, early this year, Soho in London, uh, and it emerged in considerable part because of my admiration for Guy's work. I wanted him to give a lecture in the series, but I didn't know what the series would be, and so I devised a topic uh, of the series around him. Guy is currently a UK correspondent for Crichton and a regular contributor, contributor to the Age, Sydney Morning Herald, and many other publications. He was co founding editor of Arena, a magazine of critical and social comment, and has, <coughs> is formerly a theatre critic for the Age. He's written and produced a number of TV programs and stage shows for Max Gillies. He's the author of two quarterly essays, The Opportunist, John Howard, and The Triumph of Reaction, and Bipolar Nation, How to Win the 2007 Election. Uh, he's uh, a book uh, down uh, to the crossroads uh, on the uh, tra uh, trail of the 2008 US election, one of the age book of the year. And most recently, he's published The Slacking on the Rise of the U.S. Tea Party. Uh, he's uh, also uh, aware of suits of a kind, which is why I thought I'd wear mine tonight. Uh, and uh, the title of his paper is uh, From Cold War to Cyber War Power, the State, and the WikiLeaks Effect. And after the lecture, we'll take questions. Please. website, 
um, as, as some form of journalism, as some form of, some form of subversion. Um, most of that has fallen short of really understanding what WikiLeaks means, what it is, um, and how it transforms the basic relations between uh, subjects, citizens, information, democracy, power, and the public sphere. So that will inevitably begin uh, with, with uh, um, something going back to the origin of WikiLeaks, and I will hope to bring us up to, uh, to the present uh, with a bit of impenetrable theory along the way, and then there will be uh, time for some questions and comments. Some way, sometime in December 2006, a recently former Univers Melbourne University math student, still hanging around the common room, posted a statement to the Student Society Network. Are you interested in being involved with the courageous project to reform every political system on earth and through that reform move the world to a more humane state? This rather alarming message went on to say that the people involved in this had a campaign that they'd been proposing to launch in two months, but were now being subject to a media cascade with more than 51,000 pages on Google and stories in the Washington Post and so forth. Went on to say, now we have only 22 people trying to, start, trying to usher in the start of a worldwide movement. We need help in every area, admining, coding, system admining, legal research, analysis, the post continued. Nothing unusual to this thing while we're in the context of campus politics, but of course this one was different. The author of the post was Julian Assange, and the organisation in question was WikiLeaks. Any doubt that he meant what he said about taking on the world has long since been dispelled. Any doubt that the post was written by him was also dissolved in the conclusion of a list of tasks to be done, which included writing, proofing, manning the phones, and standing around looking pretty. Five years later, and whatever criticism one might make of Assange, no one could accuse him of boasting in idleness. Few political interventions have had such spectacular effect in so short a time. Indeed, few remember that stories such as the African traffic era scandal or the Icelandic ice safe scandal were triggered by WikiLeaks. But they were dwarfed by the 2010 releases, the triple whammy of the Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, and the gradual release of the Cablegate series of diplomatic cables, and the cascade of effects real and imagined that resulted from those releases. The point between that earlier period and the current period represents a historic pivot point, uh, not merely for WikiLeaks, but for our understanding uh, of what is to be done and what is possible to be done in the new era. It also represents a sudden and radical transformation in the way that power can be understood and what the limits of power might be and what the questions might be that we can legitimately pose within the public sphere. The degree to which WikiLeaks was willing to challenge not merely the content of the public sphere but its form became clear in what might call, one might call its second period from 2007 to 2009 when the group released a series of mid-sized scoops from the climate gate emails to Sarah Palin's concealed records, concealed email records, the aforementioned Iceland banking scandal, which provoked really a revolution uh, in Iceland and, a, and an overthrow of existing power, all of which created knock-on effects to varying degrees, yet none of which really reached the categorical level of smashing the relationship between privileged information and power. For Assange, this appears to have been a frustrating process, a limitation. It had not been his intent at the time the group was founded in 2006. At that point, looking for a way in which repressive state power could be more effectively cont contested, he had drafted a paper on conspiracy and governance in which he had set out a strategy that a group like WikiLeaks might use to challenge illegitimate state power. By picturing government not as an accountable institution or as an administrative process, but as a conspiracy by a small group against a large group, i.e. the public, a countervailing power can be created by the transfer of information from the inside of the conspiracy 
to its outside. A conspiracy maintains itself as a unit of power by having a low number of internal interconnections, all of which shared a body of true information in total, while the outside of the conspiracy had access to only partial, fragmentary hearsay. The total shared knowledge of the conspiracy allowed a degree, a degree of rapid reaction that was denied those subject to it. In these circumstances, the act of leaking requires great importance because it has a number of different effects. Even the leak of a single piece of information creates three main effects. First, it changes the ratio of information between the inside and the outside of the conspiracy in favour of the latter. Secondly, it leaves a trace within a conspiracy whereby information has been breached, thus reducing the trust and cooperation within the conspiracy. Thirdly, it demands that the conspiracy expend energy identifying the source of the leak, diverting it away from taking action against the outside of the conspiracy. Should there be more than one leak, should there be a series of leaks containing vital information, then a threshold is crossed. The ratio of information between inside and outside has shifted crucially in favour of the latter. Rather than knowing nothing, the outside at least knows something of real processes unmediated by spin or propaganda. The conspiracy, meanwhile, internally, now has such a low level of trust that the internal communication of information is as much a risk as an advantage, and it is spending crucial amounts of energy attempting to prevent the leaking process. At some point in this transformation process, it becomes necessary for the conspiracy to restrict the total free flow of information in order to identify and limit the source of the leak. And one can see this in the history of, uh, of governments and the development of, uh, of security services over the course of the 20th century, that, uh, that what really begins as, as a very adjunct process of having a, a security service then becomes an autonomous unit within a state, and within that becomes developed a series of sub-autonomous units which are marked by uh, the classification system, secret, top secret, so forth and so on. In dictatorships, uh, the process is, is usually accompanied by simply cutting one part uh, of the conspiracy off from another totally and playing both parts against each other. The result ultimately is that the unity of the conspiracy is shattered and it becomes two conspiracies, a process that continues until the conspiracy is atomized. A combination of splitting and mistrust has turned it into a series of small conspiracies. One example might be one of the, uh, the situations that Assange has always referred to uh, as one of the inspirations, which was the, the release of the Vietnam uh, the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg, uh, and the subsequent whole process, which was really part of what eventually ended in Watergate, if you like, a gradual paranoia creeping into the Nixon government, which then became an autonomous process of its own, splitting off groups within it until the president became entirely isolated from <coughs> any, other, any other part of the group. Once you have a series of small conspiracies, the information ratio between inside and outside the conspiracy has moved much closer to equality, and vast amounts of energy have been spent by the conspiracy fruitlessly trying to plug the leak and divert it from other processes. In the final state of this process, really an, an ideal sort of thought state, if you like, the degree of information has been fully equalised and the conspiracy by definition has disappeared since there is now no barrier or no difference between the inside and the outside of the conspiracy. It ceased to exist. Um, Assange, his paper uh, uh, on conspiracy and governments, uh, uh, performed this as a sort of mathematical model which I was initially very impressed by. Uh, until I was told by a mathematician that it was best thought of as a metaphorical process and the uh, maths weren't really up to scratch. Nevertheless, <laughs> 
for the conspiracy to achieve, for, for the anti-conspiracy to achieve crucial categorical change becomes a question not merely of the quality of information being leaked to it, but of the quantity. For what becomes crucial in order to equalize power is that both the inside and outside of the conspiracy have, in, have access to the same information. And that crucially includes the information that is not of itself revelatory of deceit or ill intent. It is the value of having shared raw data that breaks down the imbalance of power, because the degree of deceit by a conspiracy can then be assessed and an alternative account of reality established, one not beholden to official sources that create, and this creates a structural change in power relations. The effect of such a quantitative attack on power is to demythologize it, to reverse the question, what information should we, the public, be allowed to have access to, and turns it instead to the question, why should we not have access to all information? That does not necessarily mean that the latter question, to which I return, is rhetorical. There are good reasons why some information should, should remain restricted and private in a genuinely democratic system. But once the process of information sequestration has been massively breached, the question poses itself thus, and the very nature of political legitimacy has changed. However, if this approach were nothing more than a quantitative systems theory of political change, then it would be one sided, have no impact. Central to Estange's distinctive approach to politics and information is that it is embedded within a wider idea of humanity and the necessary qualities that make the human social project possible. For Assange, as stated in a blog called IQ Org that he wrote briefly between 2005 and 2006, humans are oriented to seeking truth and being truthful. A desire for truth, however much it might be bent out of shape, distorted, or sent, sent underground by terror or total power, is essential to the human drive towards self-flourishing, towards being oneself, not merely as a unique individual, but as a body and forth of the general human spirit. Orientation towards truth, therefore, is the real motive of mass leaking, its prime mover, and the object of a secure leaking site is to make it possible for someone to do so as an expression of their life rather than a negation of it, i.e. The, the importance of a secure leaking site should be to remove or minimise the possibility that being a whistleblower in a highly secure situation is in effect a suicide mission. It should remove the idea that one has to choose between one's life and truth. WikiLeaks realigns both life and truth such that expressing truth becomes an expression of one's life, a flourishing rather than a final sacrifice. It works off the principle that it is reasonable to ask people to act honestly, to aspire to, towards the heroic, uh, the courageous and the decent, but that it is not reasonable to ask people to be martyrs, and that to ask them to be martyrs will inevitably deform a political project. By expanding the possibility for courageous action as an expression of life, the WikiLeaks process is intended to produce courage in others and reverse the deforming effects of repressive systems. Where repressive systems succeed by appealing to the most basic animal emotions of the human, raw fear, desire for security, the commitment to life as being a continued existence, the fear of, of the disruption of bodily integrity through torture or something similar. A safe whistleblowing site appeals instead to our uniquely human qualities, fidelity to truth, reciprocity, respect, recognition, and the idea of the good. It's important to understand how central this idea has been to the WikiLeaks project and uh, to the degree I'm drawing on some of the, uh, the work that Robert Mann did in an essay for the monthly uh, about this, uh, this aspect of WikiLeaks. And how it marks off from the world of hackerdom and what's known as cypherpunk from which it sprang. <coughs> Hacking in the modern sense of uh, network infiltration and free roaming, 
began in the mid-1980s as the internet began to expand from its narrow academic and military base. And its earliest exponents were by and large people oriented not to truth, but to deceit with the benign on the line, to the thrill of voyeurism, of secret and superior knowledge. The early hackers, of which Assange was one, were expert at what they called social engineering, which was tricking network administrators into giving out passwords, often through pretending to be uh, uh, other network administrators of similar in a very early and naive period of the computer revolution. The whole subculture of hacking thus fed the idea of an elite ranged against the general population. In many cases, the elite of the early hacker networks, the early black hat and grey hat hackers as they're called, easily transferred from one side of power to the other. They became security experts of the enormous state and corporate power groupings they had earlier tormented. Yet others evolved differently in a libertarian direction which began to question both the outlaw style of hacking and the structures of power that were being imposed on the new world of online interconnection. By that time, expanding ex exponentially with the 1991 invention of the World Wide Web and the sudden mass access to the internet. The hacker world by now began to intersect with two other movements. The first was the burgeoning open source or digital revolution movement. The argument that information materials, software, documents, raw information, cultural production, should not be subject to the property laws that apply to the era of print uh, and fixed physical cultural production. But the online transformation was a revolution in material <coughs> existence, which should be taken as an opportunity to remake social relations. And one part of this came from um, the American Libertarian Tradition, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, and the, uh, the sort of eternal return of the idea of a free space beyond the law. Um, one might call that the right wing side of it. The other, uh, especially in Melbourne, came from the Marxist tradition, um, from an analysis of a transformation in the, the relations and the mode of production. Uh, and it's interesting to the degree that, that uh, the, uh, the Melbourne Digital Revolution Group, led by the General Albert Langer, was one of the most uh, forward-thinking uh, Marxist contributions to that idea uh, in a city which then also bred the WikiLeaks movement. The second force was the as yet embryonic global anti-capitalist movement kicked into action by the Zapatista uprising in the Mexican state of Chiapas in 1994. Crucial of this largely indigenous uprising, which was timed uh, to coincide with the signing of the GATT agreement, which put the World Trade Organization into operation and, and became the next stage of capitalist globalization, led by the philosophy professor Rafael Vicente, better known as Subcomandante Marcus was a novel part of their operation. They ran a website, an innovation whose startling quality at the time is hard to reproduce now. The effect of the Zapatista web presence was to connect with European and US activist networks, which were then reassembling themselves after the political doldrums of the 1980s and the final collapse of the Soviet project and any residual legitimacy of Marxist vanguardism. This movement, which became known as the global anti-capitalist movement in the late 90s, increasingly used and was transformed by the flat, interconnected structure of online life to create modes of organisations which did not require party structures or hierarchies to be efficient. One of the streams that would later come into WikiLeaks was, the, uh, was members of the Chaos Computer Club, uh, a Hamburg-based outfit which had formed in the early 1980s out of a group called the K1 Commune, which was one of the most important uh, communes of the, uh, the Hamburg uh, counterculture. So uh, uh, one group had gone one way into the Greens, one group had gone one way into computers, and uh, a third group had gone into the Bar of Meinhof thing. So uh, the less said the better. The, um, 
The proponents of capitalist group globalisation spread to new era of openness, free trade, free movement, a borderless world, while the global anti-capitalist movement identified it as a new era of control through authorised movement of capital, of information through global structures fusing state and corporate power. The implicit ideology of both the open source free software movement and the global anti-capitalist movement was that total openness would overcome total closeness. And such a flat, self-organising, meta-network of groups and activists would eventually constitute a global democracy in which everyone's energy augmented everyone else's. The model for this became the World Social Forum, the annual gathering of activists which claim to speak for the 98% of people unrepresented at the parallel World Economic Forum, the Davos Group. But by the mid-2000s, it was becoming clear that the global anti-capitalist networking model was failing. For a start, it was never effectual against actual murderous and dictatorial governments who could simply harvest information on activists and then harvest the activists themselves. Secondly, in the wake of 9-11, Western governments had the pretext for what they had long decided to do, shut down the remnants of the liberal public sphere under the general notion of threat, and with the redefinition of oppositional movements within society as social enemies to be denied basic rights. Thirdly, and at a deeper level, level the simple counterposing of openness to closeness, the idea of surrounding the latter with the former, didn't work. Infinitely open networks became a mode of dissipating energy rather than focusing it, a process which could be practically mathematized, mathematized via the inverse square law. The more groups proliferated around even smaller areas of concern and special focus, the more that an increasingly monolithic power could triumph. The byproduct of that was a self regarding narcissism, as the performance of, actual, of radical action became more important than actual results. As Assange himself noted when attending the 2005 World Social Forum, it was both an activist beach party and a bunch of people making documentaries about each other. The same presence of that social forum came at the same time as his thoughts on the old question, what is to be done by crystallising? He had come from an entirely different tradition, tradition to the global anti-capitalist movement. After being part of a small group of Melbourne hackers, the international subversives, who had troubled North American defence and telecoms networks with the so-called wank worm, which confronted operators with a startup screen saying, you've been wanked, and a quote from a Midnight Oil song. <laughs> and escaping what these days be a 50-year jail sentence in the US. The Sands had become part of the international cyberpunks movement, a discussion list of former and current hackers who had become interested in the relations of power, information, and the state. Some of the cypherpunks started off or developed a sceptical attitude to the openness ideology of the free software movement. Assange's scepticism was doubled by his experience of dealing with both the Victorian legal system, its child protection system, and the shadow world of post counterculture cults such as the Hamilton Bird family, in which his own family had become entangled in his youth. One major effort to which he contributed at the time was the proposed development of a program called Rubber Hose, a system of double encryption, essentially the software equivalent of the false bottom of a suitcase, which allowed persecuted activists to give up an encrypted file of bogus information while hiding a deeper layer of true information. Such a conception of political action was from the start going in a different direction to the ideology of openness. Because the idea that what was required to break open a conspiracy was a counter-conspiracy, a tight group with guaranteed security using weapons in which activists had superiority, that is, in software design. With the WikiLeaks idea in embryo, rubber hose would step up to provide those activists who had stepped up with the equipment they needed to be brave without being doomed. In the context of a failed global anti-capitalist movement, the crucial thing about Sam's proposal for WikiLeaks was that it was an ethical counter-conspiracy. Combining exemplary action with the concrete method of safe whistleblowing, the fusion of the two supplied a level of will and determination that had started to fall out, flow out, 
of the uh, global anti-capitalist movement. In this, it mimicked forms of radical political organization that had been lost for decades. It was, to some limited degree, an expression of Leninism, not in its concrete content, but in its confidence that a small group of professional revolutionaries could take on the general will, could represent it and act on it. Some have seen Assange's actions as more anarchist, uh, propaganda of the deed in the spirit of the late 19th century anarchist groups. I disagree with this both because Assange's arguments about government, governments are not themselves anarchist. The push for WikiLeaks is not for no governments, but for better governments. But also because the WikiLeaks idea, at least in theory, considers an ongoing process of leadership and counter-conspiratorial action. In the first years of WikiLeaks, Assange looked in vain for something that would provide the opportunity for such a decisive intervention. And in 2009, he found it with the arrival of nearly three quarters of a million documents from the US Cypronet system covering the Afghan war, the Iraq war, the last 25 years of US diplomatic history, and the uh, inmates of Guantanamo. It's alleged that these files came from Bradley Manning, a young intelligence officer, disturbed by the material he was encountering during his duties. But the particular source is unimportant. What matters is that this became a categorical moment by which WikiLeaks hoped to reshape attitudes to power and the right to know. This involved some evolution of the process. The initial release, the Afghan war log, was led out by an old-fashioned scoop, the collateral murder video, followed by nearly 100,000 documents detailing the full chaos and confusion of the war. Nevertheless, WikiLeaks was still frustrated by the failure of the press to take up the opportunities to use the documents to interrogate the war in depth. So the second release, the Iraq War Logs, was done in conjunction with major, major media partners, The Guardian and The New York Times. And to a great degree, so was the third release, that of a quarter of a million diplomatic cables, still being released week by week, which gave a picture of the world of foreign relations behind the official story in the war. Both Iraq and cable day releases would to a degree become bound up in the more juicy story of a fallout between WikiLeaks and its media partners, and the even more juicy story of Assange's legal problems in Sweden. Yet there was a more important story behind their content, and that was the degree to which the mass releases themselves had a historical effect, and also the crisis they provoked in WikiLeaks. It seems to me almost unquestionable that the release of the Afghan war logs was the single event that broke the back of the war's legitimacy. But by laying out the full folly, chaos, and random autonomous process of the war, together with thousands of documents of mundane logistics, it became clear the degree to which the conflict was a malign farce. Crucial to this process was the availability of the documents. It was not necessary for everyone to read through 100,000 or so documents to know that this was the case. The crucial difference between the period pre-release of the documents and those after was the difference between assuming that the war was a farce and that the, those perpetrating it knew it, and afterwards knowing that it was and having the material to hand to show that it had always been known by those perpetrating it. In other words, it was a connection to the real and not to the imaginary, a categorical shift in who knew what. Once again, there is an example here from a history connected to political determination. In 1918, the Bolsheviks, after obtaining documents from the British Embassy, made public the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the treaty by which France and Britain in World War I had agreed to colonise the Middle East after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and despite promises of national recognition that had been made to the Arabs as the price of their joining in the war on the Allied side. Most Arab leaders, of course, were under no illusion as to the benevolence of the imperial intent. But the fact of the deal in plain sight was a categorically different moment. It made such a conspiracy real and open to both sides. In other words, in order to be an honourable person, in order to stand up for one's own respect, 
it may be impossible to ignore it. It's the moment from which the Arab national liberation movement enters a new phase and reshape the world. The cable gate releases had that effect too. As we now know, the publication of key cables from that release in the Lebanese newspaper about the decadence of the Tunisian and other ruling cliques in Arabia um, made public a situation which everyone knew, in quotes. But the realness of the revelation of the details of that decadence made it impossible for people to maintain the agreed upon pretense and retain their sense of their own dignity their human being. And it was no coincidence that the other event, the matching event, that really sparked off the Arab Spring was the self-immolation of a man reduced to the pure survival of selling fruit and vegetables and then denied even that when his scales and his permit were confiscated. Ground to nothingness by a decadent state, negated as even the most basic uh, a human being in terms of his animal needs of reproduction and survival. He regained his full humanity by the means of his death. And that death then created a double call to stand up for a collective human dignity. Most importantly, Cablegate put the outside and inside of power on the same footing. Suddenly, without a 30-year rule, with no filtering, we could read what diplomats had been doing in our name in a process that essentially ate the national negotiation procedures of the Middle Ages. From the revelation that a leading power broker of the ALP was regularly trotting off to have meetings with the US Embassy, to the coverage of the US's attempts to spy on the UN and undermine global governments, to the pointless and self-justifying pen portraits penned by the Ivy League elite who comprised the US diplomatic corps, Cable gate demythologized and desanctified diplomatic copy. And the question that occurred to millions of people simultaneously was why shouldn't we be allowed to read this stuff right now? Once done, such a categorical step cannot be undone, even if many of its specific horrors or revelations fade away in the immediate aftermath. The question is open. Whatever the question procedures be by which genuine representatives of actually existing democracies decide which material should be available and which should be held back, the old relationship can no longer survive as fully legitimate. In response to this, the powers that could be could only summon the worst case scenario principle. What if some terrible powerful secret leaked out? Yet after half a century of secrecy, which had spanned everything, from the potential annihilation of the Cuban Missile Crisis to the Iraq catastrophe, it was clearly arguable that our greatest threat was not secrecy, was, was from secrecy, not from openness. Furthermore, what was certain was that no, there was no reason why much of this secrecy was utterly necessary. It was a carry-on from an earlier era, stretching back hundreds of years, maintained by a, a self-justifying clique of right for negotiation. It was this intervention that signposted the most radical effect of WikiLeaks so far, but it sharpened and posed in an unavoidable way the question of how the fundamental structures of power should change in an era when the basic mode of information was changing. In a revolution so radical, it can only be compared to the invention of writing. That latter event in the city-states of ancient Sumer gave us the notion of empire and the state possibility of property, of land ownership, and social class, the original division of information. The rise of printing in the 15th and 16th century, century essentially gave us the invention of modern politics. The movement and the party initially figured as the religious sect formed around a particular interpretation of the Holy Scriptures with completing claims to truth. The period of revolutions then, from the rise of Protestants through the Dutch Republic to the English Revolution of 1688 are in one aspect revolutions of printing against manuscript of the new class created by the mass literacy that of the citizen revolting against the monarch and the subject 
and it's then no coincidence that it's in this period that the, the Westphalia, the Treaty of Westphalia was signed, which creates the modern state and the modern nation state, the idea of a single territorially bound to power. From that perspective, we can see WikiLeaks as the self-conscious vanguard of a large global revolution that has barely begun, one against the frozen and decadent power relations which relied on control of the means of information when, as per printing, it was a material commodity which could be censored or controlled in borders, in libraries and archives. That is not of itself an anarchist charter, and it is, even though it is in the interest of the status quo to present it as such, but rather an opening to reconsider the institutions which might make up governance and representation. In that respect, everything is up for grabs, from the idea of a unity territory, a unitary territorial state to the notion of a thrice yearly elected parliamentary dictatorship presented as democracy. That is the product of the great transformation of human relations, but necessary to the forcing of that process has been a counter conspiracy to break a hole in the monolith of existing power and through exemplary action show us that that is possible. And that, I would argue, is the WikiLeaks moment. Thank you very much. Thank you.